بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا الى الله باذنه وسراجا منيرا صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى اله واصحابه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم افلا ينظرون الى الابل كيف خلقت والى السماء كيف رفعت والى الجبال كيف نصبت والى الارض كيف سطحت فذكر انما انت مذكر لست عليهم بمسيطر إلا من تولى وكفر فيعذبه الله العذاب الأكبر إن إلينا إيابهم ثم إن علينا حسابهم صدق الله العظيم وقال النبي صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم كلكم راع وكلكم مسؤول عن رعيته وقال النبي صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم الكيس من دان نفسه وعمل لما بعد الموت والعاجز من اتبع نفسه هواها وتمنى على الله الامان او كما قال عليه الصلاه والسلام صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك لمن الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم صل على سيدنا نبينا مولانا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا نبينا مولانا محمد وبارك وسلم <coughs> My dear respected brothers and elders in deen it is a great fadl of Allah azza wa jal that he has granted us this beautiful ni'mat of iman and islam and due to this ni'mat of iman and islam we recognize these moments as the moments of the blessed month of ramadan today is the 16th of march say today is the 16th of march to every person in the world 7 billion people spent today believing today was the 16th of march nobody disputed that but from the 7 billion people the approximate 3 billion people that allah has granted them with the blessing of iman and islam they did not dispute the fact that today is the 16th of march but along with today being the 16th of march they also accepted cherished and valued the fact that today is a day of ramadan depending in which country you reside it will either be the 4th of ramadan the 5th of ramadan or the 6th of ramadan but from 7 billion human beings there are approximately 3 billion people that looked at these 24 hours differently and the reason why they looked at these 24 hours differently it is because of iman and islam today in tarawih 
the Huffaz, they recited one verse. Alhamdulillah, illadhi hadana lihada, wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. All praise is for that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has guided us towards this, towards this hidayat, towards the correct path, towards the sirat mustaqim which we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for in every salah and every rakat of every salah. And that sirat mustaqim the straight path, is the path of Iman and Islam. Today on earth there are two types of people from the believers. One group of people who are the majority are those that have been born in a Muslim family. Their parents were Muslim. So Allah gave them Iman and Islam through the medium of their parents. There is a minority of Muslims in the world that they reverted to Islam. They were in pursuit of the truth and Allah Azza wa Jal guided them towards the truth. And then they accepted Islam with Allah's guidance and they reverted to Islam. So if you look at the entire Muslim population, approximately 3 billion people, either you were born a Muslim, you were given this Iman and Islam through the medium of your parents and Allah made it so. Or you were in pursuit of the truth, you had questions. And you went in pursuit of the truth and Allah guided you to the truth and Allah allowed you to accept the truth. And today you are a believer because of Allah's guidance. Alhamdulillahilladhi hadana lihada. Wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. We were never able to tread the path of truth and righteousness, the sirat mustaqim, if it not were the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gave us this iman and Islam either through our parents or either in pursuit of the truth and Allah guided us towards the truth either way how you got there is not important because it's not our doing it is the doing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what is the most important thing is you are now on sirat mustaqim Allah has placed you on this path known as Siratun Mustaqim. That path that leads us to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That path that pleases Allah Azza wa Jal. That path that will take us to Jannat and that path that will save us from Jahannam. So we need to be grateful to Allah Azza wa Jal. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this blessing of Iman and Islam. Whether through our parents or whether through an effort which Allah guided the human being towards and that person was in pursuit of the truth and Allah led him to the truth and today he is a believer. Some people ask this question. Allah forbid that the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unfair. Why did Allah make three billion people Muslim? <coughs> and why did Allah make four billion people non-Muslim? Why did he deprive them of Iman and Islam? When Iman and Islam is so important. That with Iman and Islam, a person will gain the pleasure of Allah Azza wa Jal and a person will gain entry to Jannat. Deprivation of Iman and Islam will earn a person the wrath of Allah Azza wa Jal and it will take that person to the fire of Jahannam. <coughs> this is not Solely Allah's decree. Allah's decree is such that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Sayyiduna Adam alayhi salam, 
Allah made him the best of humanity in the sense that the highest stage and a rank a human being can reach that is the rank of nubuwa and prophethood Sayyiduna Adam alayhi salam if Allah so desired Allah could have made him a human being like he did Allah could have made him the first human being like he did Allah did not have to make him a Nabi and a Rasul but Allah made him a Nabi and a Rasul because a Nabi and a Rasul is the highest stage and highest rank any human being can achieve or any human being can receive rather because Nubuwat and Prophethood cannot be achieved Nubuwat and Prophethood can only be received Allah made him a Nabi so he became a Nabi Allah made him a Rasul he became a Rasul and that goes for all the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam no Nabi became a Nabi out of his effort every Nabi was chosen by Allah Azza wa Jal and this honor was placed unto him and he was given this honor by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so Allah made Adam alayhi salam in Nabi and Rasul and the whole of humanity or the offspring of that Nabi this is why the historians they say Ibn Kathir alayhi rahma Ibn Kathir is a great commentator of the Quran Sharif he is the student of Ibn Taymiyyah Rahimahullah Shaykh al-Islam hence Shaykh al-Islam is somebody respected in the Arab and the non-Arab world we also refer to him as Shaykh al-Islam even though there are certain masail that we differ with him we disagree but we disagree with respect we disagree with honor even today when we take his name we give him the title that he surely deserves Shaykh al-Islam Rahimahullah Ibn Taymiyyah Rahimahullah Ibn Kathir is a student of Ibn Taymiyyah Rahimahullah so Ibn Taymiyyah he is not only a commentator of the Quran he is also a great muhaddith because his tafsir of the Quran Sharif he has utilized the ahadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to explain the beautiful words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Ibn Kathir alayhi rahma is also a very well known and respected and honored historian his works al bidaya wa nihaya a huge piece of work very well respected globally he explains the Sayyiduna Adam alayhi salam his offspring he had children his wife our grandmother Hazrat Hawa radiallahu anha she had children and them having children was miraculous we don't have time to go into the details I'm sure most of you are aware she would give birth and she would give birth in a sh short span of time not nine months pregnancy and each time she gave birth she gave birth to twins a male and a female hence Allah Azza wa Jal miraculously used Adam and Hawa alayhi salam so that they can be the means of the entire world having human being and having its residence because the human beings are the residents of the world Allah explains this in the Quran and he did this through Adam and Hawa every human being in the time of Adam alayhi salam was a believer in Allah there was no kafir there was no mushrik for many 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 years everybody taught everybody followed the teachings of Adam alayhi salam Cain and Abel Habil and Qabil they had a dispute Qabil made a mistake Qabil went against the teachings of his father he was the first one to commit the sin of murder he murdered his brother so there was sin that took place but there was no kufr there was no shirk the human race was one family Allah introduced the human race on earth as the followers of one religion as the followers of Islam what is Islam Islam is the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the belief of the Nabi and Prophet of the time so those that accepted the teachings of Adam alayhi salam they were Muslim 
This continued for a very long period of time. Only just before the advent and the coming of Nuh alayhi salam did shirk show its ugly face on the face of this earth. Ascribing partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed its ugly face then. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that happened because of the degeneration of the human being. It happened because the human beings, the Muslims of the time, they started to distance themselves from the sirat -e mustaqim They started to lose their identity. They started to become weak. That is when shaitan took advantage of the situation. Otherwise, Ibn Kathir alayhi rahmah, he says, Soon after Adam alayhi salam, Iblis shaitan, he was forced to have a meeting by the jinn on earth. Those jinn that were kafir. Because remember the jinn were the first residents of earth before the human beings. And the jinn, those that were kafir and mushrik to the present day, those jinn that are kafir and mushrik, they have a jealousy for the human race because Allah replaced the jinn by means of the human being, by means of Sayyiduna Adam alayhi salam and his offspring. So the jinn, they forced a meeting with Iblis. Brothers, please come closer. There are brothers sitting right close to the door. So please make your way forward. The jinn, they came together and they said, we need to have a meeting with Iblis. This Iblis has been making us false promises. Iblis has promised us that yes, Allah Azza wa Jal, He cleansed the world of the kufar jinn. He destroyed the majority of the jinn. And there are only the remnants of the jinn left behind. But Iblis promised us that if you follow me and if you support me, we shall rule the world once again. But there is no kufar. There is no shirk. Everybody is following the teachings of Sayyiduna Adam alayhi salam. So he has made us false promises. So the jinn, they forced a meeting with Iblis. And Iblis held this meeting with the jinn. Firstly, he got a mouthful from the jinn that were present. That you misled us. You lied to us. You took us for a ride. You deceived us. What you promised us, we cannot see any signs of. Iblis said, wait, you have to be patient. You may think that I have failed. You may think that I have deceived. But I have been planting the seeds. You have to be patient. And when you will be patient, you will see the fruits of my labor. And the ugly head of shirk, are the direct results of the labor of Iblis and the Shayateen. When the same human beings had no idea, they were completely oblivious to shirk. It was completely alien to the human being. It is impossible for a human being to bow his head in front of a piece of stone. It is impossible for anyone to believe in a piece of stone that they have carved with their own hands. But what did shaitan do? Shaitan, he took the human beings away from their identity. He weakened their identity. Very, very slowly, he injected his poison into the human beings. And he waited for the poison to do its work. He worked on one generation. And he waited for that generation to die out to see the results of his efforts on that generation on the next generation. Because today in Salah, we also heard that Shaitan, he complained to Allah that Allah, you have evicted me. You have removed me. But give me time and respite. Allah said, I have given you respite till the day of judgment. No Nabi was given life till the day of judgment. No other jinn was given a lifespan to the day of judgment.
But this Iblis, Allah gave him respite and time till the final day. So he's got time at his hands. So he had a strategy. He employed that strategy on one generation. He sat back and he waited. And he wanted to the see, see the results of those efforts on the next generation. Phase two. He then put his strategy into action. Phase two. He waited for the entire generation to die out. Waiting to see the results in the next generation. Phase three. This is how he introduced shirk. Those human beings that had no idea. It was alien to them. It was impossible that a human being can bow before stone. Lo and behold, suddenly, we have people worshipping stone and idols. So shaitan, he took them away from their identity. Allah Azza wa Jal, he commanded Nuh alayhi salatu wa salam, <coughs> that O oh Nuh, these human beings, they were one. They came from one father. They came from one mother. They had one religion. They were united. They were unanimous. They believed in the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jal. This Iblis, Shaitan, he has infiltrated their Iman. He has infiltrated their hearts and minds. Now the same human being, a minority of them, have started to worship stone. A minority of them has started to worship stone. A minority of them has started to worship stone. Go into them amongst them and remind them of their identity. Remind them who they are. Sayyiduna Nuh alayhi salam. What did he say to his people? Oh people, I've come to remind you that you are the subjects of Allah. You are the servants of Allah. If you are his subjects and his servants, then you should be bowing before him and him alone. Only his command and his decree is important to you. What happened? Only a small minority of people accepted the call of Nuh alayhi salam. The tables have turned. The majority previously were on the truth. The minority was on shirk. Now, the majority are on shirk. The minority are on iman. It was Allah's decree that Allah wiped the slate clean. Allah destroyed every human being on earth. This is why we refer to Sayyiduna Nuh alayhi salam as our second forefather. The first being Sayyiduna Adam alayhi salam and the second Nuh alayhi salam because we are the offspring of Nuh alayhi salatu wa salam. The offspring of Adam alayhi salatu wa salam, they were destroyed, all the kafirs. Only a small group of them that were with Nuh alayhi salatu wa salam on the ark, they survived. And then the human race continued as the offspring of the children of Nuh alayhi salatu wa This is why he is referred to as Jaddathani, the second forefather. Because Allah Azza wa Jal wiped the slate clean. So he reminded the human being of its identity. Again, in the children of Nuh alayhi salatu wa salam, the same thing happened. For a certain time, they remembered their legacy and they remembered the legacy of Sayyiduna Nuh alayhi salam. And they remained stuck to it. They remained dedicated to it. But as shaitan promised, and as he does, generation after generation, he started to work on the children of Sayyiduna Nuh alayhi salam. Degeneration took place. People started to lose their way. They became wayward. They lost the sirat mustaqim to the extent when the sirat mustaqim became odd and strange and kufr and shirk became the norm. So the identity of the human race as the subjects of Allah, as the servants of Allah changed. 
they became the subject of their carnal desire and they became subject of shaitan iblis was successful in his endeavor but allah azza wa jal he kept sending his prophets and these prophets they came to remind the human race of their identity <clears throat> that you are the servants of allah you are the subjects of allah and these arguments for example i pose the question that the system of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unjust why did allah choose to make four billion human beings kafir and mushrik the fuel of jahannam and why did he choose three billion to be muslims and believers to be the residents of jannat so allah's system is unfair that is the statement and this is a very very old statement it's not new it has been kept by iblis in his briefcase every now and then he opens his briefcase and he throws it out into the people so this is a question you will hear this question attacks your identity directly this question attacks the identity of our children directly sometimes this question is asked indirectly as we know everything and everyone is evolving not because of evolution because this is how allah created the world didn't we understand from what we have just heard that from adam alayhi salam and all being muslims the human race evolved and developed to a stage where the minority were believers and the majority were disbelievers and at times the majority were believers and the minority were disbelievers so the world evolves the people evolve and develop and shaitan he is extremely patient he works on one generation and waits for the entire generation to die out to see the fruits of his effort and he evaluates and reviews his strategy with the next generation whatever changes he desires and he needs to make he makes and he applies them to this generation he waits for this entire generation to die out and he waits for the results on the next generation so every nabi and rasul came to remind the human being of the human being's identity and that identity what is mine and your identity what is the identity of every human being first and foremost we are the subjects and the servants of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the sahaba asked nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what are the best names in the eyes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what names does he love the most nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said allah loves abdullah the name abdullah allah loves the name abdul rahman why because in the name there is the person's identity in the name is the identity of the human race abdullah the subject of allah the servant of allah abdul rahman the servant of ar rahman the subject of ar rahman that is our identity every now and then shaitan and iblis and his forces will question this identity and this questioning will come to us in many many different forms and from many many different places either from social media a short clip on tiktok and the hidden message from iblis and shaitan questioning your identity a short video on youtube somebody claiming to be an ex-muslim leaving behind a question that questions your identity a lecturer in university a lecturer in university a lecturer in university in the midst of his lecture will leave behind a cliffhanger or a question that questions your identity if you believe in allah where is your allah how can you believe in a being whom you believe to be the most powerful being but yet he cannot be seen everything you have been taught from you when you were a child 
every hypothesis that was put before you and presented to you, with every hypothesis came evidence. Today there is this hypothesis. Allah is the most powerful being. So where is the evidence? Where is this Allah? Is he on this mimbar? Is he in this masjid? Is he on the roof of the masjid? Is he beneath the earth? Is he above the heavens? Is he on his arsh? Where is this Allah that you believe in? If you want me to believe in your Allah, and I am open to this idea, I am not negating it. This is what they will say. Convince me. Convince me. I am willing to become a Muslim. But convince me that this powerful being Allah is here. Where is he? Describe him. Take me to him. Let me hear him. Let me feel him. Where is he? Question. Either from social media platforms, either in the lecture room. Today apostasy has become a hot subject. And rightly so. Because it has become the problem of society. Where does apostasy start from? Apostasy starts from a question. And that question results in doubt. Every act of kufr, every act of shirk, every act of apostasy stems from doubt. Doubt is the mother of all evil. This is what the Quran says. When Allah introduces the Quran, what does Allah say? Alif Lam Mim. kitabu la rayba That this is that book in which there is no doubt. Whatever that is mentioned in this book is the truth, is reality. There is no doubt. If you honestly and winningly are in pursuit of the truth, then go in search of the truth. Use the words of Allah as your guidance. As long as you are just in your heart, you will reach the truth. Because the Quran, as far as the Quran is concerned, there is white and there is black. The color does gray does not exist in the Quran. The color gray does not exist in the vocabulary of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The color gray does not exist in the vocabulary of the Sahaba Kiram radiallahu anhu ajmain. It is either white or it is black. There is no such thing as gray. And the Quran, everything the Quran says, it is the truth. It has been evidenced and it is there in front of us. So these questions, number one, we need to be alert. We need to be aware. Where are these questions coming from? So number one, social media is the biggest platform where these questions are being dished out. And many times they use individuals that claim to be ex-Muslims. Nine out of ten, they are liars, fabricators. Whether they are fabricators or not, we do not need to go into the detail. We do not need to investigate. We don't need to become Sherlock Holmes. Leave them. There is no need for us to investigate. Whatever they stand for, whatever they believe, it is between them and their Allah. If they claim to be ex-Muslims, that is their problem. Not mine or not yours. But the most important thing is their depiction. Them exhibiting themselves as ex-Muslim is a ploy. Is a ploy of shaitan and iblis. If a person claims to be an ex-Muslim, then that shows that person's weakness. It shows that person's deprivation. It, it shows that person is accursed. When Allah has granted somebody Iman and Islam in either one of the two avenues that we explained in the beginning, either through birth or through exploration, once you have tasted the sweetness of Iman and Islam, you resort to the filth of kufr and shirk, then you are not even worthy of being a human being. This is how low you are. So as soon as you see this, 
That means you do not click there. It means you do not investigate it. It means this is poison. It means this is filth. It is napaki. Why would you want to put your finger in the urine of a swine and then wash your finger in the sink? When you know this is filth, you know this is urine of a swine. That is how filthy it is. Why would you want to dip your finger in it? What should you do? You see it and you move away from it. You leave it. Whether it is in your classroom, because not every teacher in every classroom is a believer. Many teachers are atheists. Many teachers are Islamophobic. <coughs> Many lecturers are atheists. Many lecturers are Islamophobic. Or they have a bias against belief and against religion. And they will leave you with a question in their discourse which is poison. No sooner you hear that question, you should become alarmed. And you should say to yourself, as far as science is concerned, as far as geography is concerned, as far as mathematics is concerned, as far as history is concerned, as far as physics is concerned, and as far as my work is concerned, I'm all ears. When it comes to my Iman, when it comes to my heart, then no thank you. No thank you. Because this is another message from the devil. They say that the system of Allah is unjust. Firstly, show me where this Allah is. So we ask them a question. Have you been to France? He says, no. Do you believe in the existence of the Eiffel Tower? Yes, I do. Have you seen the Eiffel Tower? No, I haven't. Why do you believe in the Eiffel Tower? Because I've read it. I've seen pictures of it. So there is evidence that's making you believe that the Eiffel Tower exists, even though you've not been there. Similarly, the Quran and the prophets, they are evidence for us in the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If my Allah says he is everywhere in the Quran, then my Allah is everywhere. I do not need to convince you because Allah has not sent me to convince you. Allah has sent me so that I may share with you my belief and why I believe it. We say that Allah has introduced himself to humanity through his Quran Sharif. So they then ask us, how can you say that this is the word of Allah? How can the Quran Sharif be the word of Allah? Well, the answer is obvious. The Quran Sharif is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there is no other word like this on earth. There is no book like this on earth. This book has been in existence for 15 centuries, revealed over 23 years. Every letter of this book has been preserved and protected for 15 centuries and there has been regularly on regular intervals the stooges of shaitan and iblis who tried to infiltrate the message of this beautiful book the message of our allah and each time they failed miserably and they will continue to do so till the day of judgment and they will continue to fail miserably till the day of judgment so just the fact that this book is in its pristine form for 15 centuries is evidence that this is the word of Allah. There is no other book that you can say this about. There is no other person's statement that you can say this about. This is exclusively for our Quran Sharif. Millions of people memorize the Quran. And Allah has made it easy for them to memorize the Quran. Look at Ramadan, the Hufaz Quran. They stand on the Musalla and they recite the words of Allah Azza wa Jal. One Zabar Zair Pesh, Fatha Dhamma Kasra, they make a mistake in and immediately they are corrected. If they are not corrected, they will repeat the verse to ensure they have corrected it. This is the most translated book on earth. 
This is the most read book on earth. Imagine how many masajid on earth just in Blackburn. Kitni masajid hai? Over 40 masajid in our town. One small town. Over 40 masajid. Five times salah. In every masjid the imam stands on the musalla. And the imam recites the Quran. In every masjid, alhamdulillah, there are people that sit in the masjid and they recite the Quran. There are thousands of people in their homes that they recite the Quran. There are thousands of children who attend the madrasa every day and they recite the Quran, they learn the Quran. Millions of people around the world every single day are dedicated to this word, to this kitab, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is evidence that this can only be the word of Allah. This can only be the Quran. Hence, its exclusive position. Hence, how many lives have changed by means of this kalam? Which other book has changed so many lives? People in pursuit of the truth, they open the Quran. They read a few verses. It takes one verse to penetrate the heart and say, you know what? There is no other truth than the truth of the Quran. Islam, even today, is the fastest growing, growing religion on earth. There are more people accepting Iman and Islam than any other religion. Why? This is the truth of Iman and Islam. This is the truth of Allah's word. This is the truth of the Quran Sharif. So this question, the where is this Allah? You believe that there is a country by the name of Russia and it exists. Have you been? How many of us have been to Russia here? If you've been to Russia, raise your hand. You've been in Jamaat. MashaAllah. All of us, we've not been to Russia. Barabar. But we all believe in the existence of Russia. Yes? Even though we've not been. Why? How can you believe that there is this huge mass the size larger than the United States, larger than China, as it's been depicted on the map. But have you ever questioned, why is the United Kingdom so small on the map? Why is the United States so big? Why is Canada even bigger than the United States? Why is Africa the way it's shaped? Have you ever questioned why the map it is the way it is? You haven't. Why not? It's a completely intellectual argument to question who drew the map? How did they come to this decision that the United Kingdom is shaped in this manner? Didn't they say that the world is evolving over time? Bits or masses broke off? And then they developed into countries. There is shift and movement all the time. Have you seen the map changing in the last five years? Have you seen a different version of the atlas or the map? You haven't. But you've not questioned it. We've not been to Russia. But we believe in the existence of Russia. Nobody negates it. If I was to sit here and say, okay, bye, listen to me, oh brothers. Russia does not exist. It's a big lie. You laugh in my face. So similar, the word of Allah and the introduction of Allah and the entire system throughout the history of man is sufficient for us to believe in the existence of Allah because there were times on this earth when the entire human race believed in Allah. This country that we live in, there was a time when over 98% of this country believed in the existence of Allah. 98% of this country were a religious community. Things have changed. Hence the questions. Behaviors have changed. Hence the questions. So when we are asked these questions, what should we do? What do we do? There are a number of these questions that are utilized. And I promise you, there is about 25 or 28 questions that they have. And these are the only cards that they keep playing. They don't have any other card besides these 25 or 28. And each time they play it, unfortunately, 
They hope that somebody is going to trip up, somebody is going to fall prey. But this ummah is not so weak. We are not so weak that we are going to trip up because of one silly question coming from a foolish person. No sooner does that person asking the question stand before you, the first thing that come, must come across in my mind is this person is dangerous. I need to move away as soon as possible. If he is a teacher or a lecturer, then yes, as far as the subject is concerned, I don't have a choice. But when it comes to my deen, when it comes to what to believe and what not to believe, he's not in the classroom for that reason, and I am not ears. I am not going to listen to him. I'm not going to entertain him. I'm not going to argue with him. Because this is what Allah explained in the verses that I have recited before you. And let me tell you one other thing. Wallahi al-Azim. I'll say it again. Wallahi al-Azim. And I'll say it once more. Wallahi al-Azim. If they have 28 questions in their armory, Wallahi al-Azim, we have 28 answers for each one of them. How many? 28. And that is minimum. But we don't have the time to sit with somebody who doesn't have the capacity to understand, appreciate those 28 answers for each one of their 28 questions. If the need arises, then inshallah aziz, bi idhnillahi azza wa jal, we are ready. But not every person is equipped to do so. So not every person should take on this challenge. For us, as soon as we hear these questions, the first thing that we do, we switch off. You think of that person as somebody who is an enemy of your faith. One apostate once asked me a question. Maulana, Allah's system is unjust because my lecturer, he is a fantastic guy. He's looked after me. He's done favors to me. He is a really, really nice guy. But your Quran says that a disbeliever will go into the fire of Jahannam. So why should my lecturer go into the fire of Jahannam when he is such a generous guy, such a kind guy, such a compassionate person, such a thoughtful person, such a caring person. And the list goes on and on and on and on. The answer, very easy. Your lecturer, he is everything that you have said. We agree with you. But you didn't know the fact that he was growing cannabis in his home. And he was selling his cannabis from his home. And he lived 50 miles away from your university. So you couldn't smell the cannabis on campus. But one morning suddenly you wake up and it's front page news. Such and such a person, lecturer of this university, a master of his subject, arrested overnight, plants worth 50,000 pounds found in his basement, in custody. So our question to you, my brother, your lecturer is still kind, compassionate, loving, caring, and the rest of it. Are you now going to go to that police station that holds him to say, that please let my lecturer go. He's so kind, he's so compassionate, he's so caring, he's this, he's that. What will the custody sergeant tell you? Okay, thank you, but no thank you. He may be everything that you say, but in our eyes, he's a criminal. In your eyes, he is all of those things. In our eyes, he is a criminal. He is a com criminal in the eyes of the law. So your lecturer must be A, B, C, D, and all the way to Z. But if he is a disbeliever, he is a criminal in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you protest outside the courtroom, and every student that attends that stupid class of yours, and you protest to say that, we don't want our lecturer to go to prison. 
He should be shown mercy. He should avoid a custodial sentence. You can scream all you want. You can protest all you want. A just system will say, we are sorry to tell you, he has been found guilty through the judicial system. He's done the crime. He must do the time. Then you can keep sending him cakes when he's in prison. So if this person is a criminal in the eyes of Allah, Allah's prison is Jahannam. So he goes. He's done the crime. He must do the time. Then they ask you a question. The crime he did, kufr, 60 years, 70 years. He lived for 80 years. He was a kafir for 80 years, Molana. Why is Allah sending him into Jahannam? Khali deena fiha abada. Allah is saying he will be in Jahannam forever and ever and ever. So the sin is finite. The sin is restricted to 80 years. But the punishment is infinite. Allah is saying forever and ever and ever. That is unjust. The first answer. This is just not for the Jahannam. Allah said with regards to Jannat. That's once you go in there, you will be in there forever and ever and ever. So this doesn't just apply to punishment. It also applies to favor. When Allah rewards somebody and Allah will give them Jannat, you were a believer for 80 years. You did namaz for 80 years. You did tilawat for 80 years. You gave charity for 80 years. Then why is Allah placing you in Jannat forever and ever and ever? At the same time, many, many people will be taken out of Jahannam, placed into Jannat. Nobody will be taken out of Jannat and placed into Jahannam. Nobody, not one, will be taken out of Jannat and placed into Jahannam. What is this? Their question is a sign of their ignorance. Their question is a side sign of their stupidity. Answer number two. The place of effort is the world. Kufar o iman. A'mal o sin. But the place of recompense and reward is the akhirat. The dunya, everything is finite. Everything is. And in the akhirat, everything is infinite. So there are two different alams. Because we as Muslims are very well aware of this. Because we recite it every day, in every namaz, in every rakat. We say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. This dunya is one alam. The qabr is another alam. The akhirat is another alam. And you came through some alams before you came here. You came from the alam of the womb of the mother. alam rahim Before that you came from the alam of arham. Arawah. Which is the alam of the ruh. The souls. So the crime was committed on earth. But the place of reward and punishment is the hereafter. So that will apply. And the third answer, as I said, for each one, we've got 28 answers, but you don't have the time. Your stomachs are growling already. Some of you may have questions and the brothers will start making signs to me from the back. Answer number three. If Allah is judge and jury, who the hell do we think we are to question? You can jump as much as you want, scream as much as you want. It's going to make no difference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what Allah says in the Quran. But anyway, this is a subject that I did want to speak about. But remember one thing. The best answer that you can give anyone and everyone is, forget the intellectual arguments. Leave them. We say, like Imam Razi rahimahullah said, I believe in my Allah, and not just believe him, I love my Allah more than myself, more than my mother, more than my father. I love him more than anything because he is my Allah. And I believe in him. I love him. And I try my best to follow his instruction without any evidence. Without any evidence. Without any evidence. 
بغیر دلیل کے what are they going to count to argue that how all they're going to turn around and say to you is this person is a radical or this person is an extremist or this person is stupid or he's lost his mind it's okay if somebody says i've lost my mind because i i love my allah azza wa jal wallahi alazim i have no problem with that and neither should you so we say we believe in allah without any evidence we believe in rasulullah and we love him more than ourselves without any evidence because we are not here to give evidence evidence has been provided by allah we are just here to show number one that we are abdullah and abdul rahman and number two we are the ummah of nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam so this is what we need to learn this is what we need to teach our children and i'll tell you one thing my brothers to conclude you know they can try all they want if you have love for your deen you have blind love for your allah and you have blind love for your rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam wallahi alazim one of them or a million of those idiots they cannot change you or they cannot change anything they've tried for centuries this iblis he is very 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 old he has seen every nabi and every rasul he has even seen jannat allah mentioned it today in tarawi how he deceived adam alayhi salam in jannat he lied in jannat he said that allah is stopping you from eating from the forbidden tree because allah does not want you to become like angels if you eat from the tree you will become like angels or if you eat from the tree you will remain in jannat forever and ever and ever he deceived them allah allowed it to happen allah allowed it to happen why because allah had already planned that the human beings will be the residents of the dunya and the dunya is will be a place of test for the human beings and their greatest enemy will be the shaitan and iblis so this serves as a reminder the same iblis tried his tricks in jannat this is the dunya jannat is a place that nobody can try tricks there but he did in that is a message that iblis and his cronies and every one of these idiots that throw these questions in your direction they are the cronies of shaitan and iblis you should not have an iota an ounce a millimeter of respect for that person because he has attacked your faith he is trying to put doubt in your iman yes as far as your lesson is concerned ad dhururatu tataqaddaru bi qadr ad dhurura it's a necessity we go to the bathroom and we urinate into the toilet because it's a necessity the worst place in your home is the toilet yes it should be we only in there for that few moments that we need to be in there so ad dhururatu tataqaddaru bi qadr ad dhurura if we have to call him sir to pass our exams that we'll call him sir but if he comes anywhere near my heart then i'm sorry that we do not tolerate because iman and islam comes before anything and everything allah says in these verses afala yanduruna ila al ibl kayfa khuliqat do they not see the camel how we have created it if any human beings just ponders on the creation of the camel it is sufficient for him to become a muslim afala yanduruna ila al ibl kayfa khuliqat wa ila as sama kayfa rufi'at and the heavens how we have lifted it above just that without any pillars without any crane a person if he ponders he will become a muslim wa ila al ardi kayfa sutihat do they not see the earth how we have spread it and how the earth serves its purpose if a human being thinks about it he will become a muslim afala yanduruna ila al ibli kayfa khuliqat wa ila as samaa kayfa rufi'at wa ila al jibal kayfa nusibat the mountains how we have erected them wa ila al ardi kayfa sutihat look around you that creation is sufficient to take you to your allah fadhkir inna ma anta mudhkir o nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam remind them because your position is of a reminder 
لست عليهم بمسيطر you have not been sent to them to forcefully make them believe you have not been sent to them to make them believe you are just there to remind them because Allah's oneness has already been programmed within them it only takes a reminder it only takes for you to blow the dust from them and they will recognize the oneness of Allah لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِمُسَيْطِرِ and then Allah says those that disbelieve if they want to be atheist and if they want to spend their entire lives looking for our Allah let them look if they want to spend their entire lives looking for Rasulullah let them look and if they die on kufr that is their share of Jahannam that is their problem that is their issue Allah will not ask you or I why my lecturer or your lecturer has ended up in the fire of Jahannam nobody will be asked that question and that is mentioned in the Quran Sharif this is the misconception when people think that I will be asked on the day of judgment why Winston Churchill died as a kafir the Quran and Sunnah does not say this you can ask any senior scholar anybody who says this is a scholar if they are a scholar they are a scholar of shallow knowledge so you should abstain from them anybody who has ilm and knowledge they will tell you and confirm this that you and I will not be asked regarding the kufr of Winston Churchill you and I will only be questioned regarding the iman and kufr of those people that are our subordinates kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyati wal rajulu ra'in ala ahli baytih wal mar'atu ra'iyatun ala bayti zawjiha wa waladi bas i am responsible for my household i will be asked regarding the iman and amal of every person of my household where I had a duty to share my iman, that is something different. Allah can ask. But to think that every kafir that dies on kufr, then Allah will ask me regarding him. No, there is no such thing. That is a fabrication. That is not in our shariat. So if they decide to remain on kufr and die on kufr, that is their lot. That is their decision. They will go to the fire of Jahannam. This is Allah's decree. We do not apologize. We don't need to apologize. We don't want to apologize. Because who are we to apologize? The decree is Allah. The hidayat comes from Allah. And everybody is to return to Allah. So we leave it to Allah. So my brothers, I hope what we have spoken serves as a message and a reminder to us all that in these challenging times, this is what we need to have in our hearts as individuals and we need to imprint this into the hearts of our children because remember shaitan and iblis waits for the entire generation to die out before he will review and change his strategy for the next generation may allah ta'ala protect one and all jazakumullah khairan Gee, my brothers, if anybody has a question, next week, inshallah, this is what we will do is some people, they are embarrassed or ashamed to stand up and ask a question. So write it on a piece of paper and send it to the front. We will answer it from the sheet of paper. And if you want to stand up and ask, then alhamdulillah, stand up and ask. Bismillah. We have a very large but a very learned gathering, mashallah. Ha, kuch bhi pooch lo. Shart itni hai ki mujhe iska jawab aana chahiye. Ji, farmaye. Aapka shuvi hai, just one second. Ji, bhai. So the brother is asking a question that you've just come to the salah or you're in salah with jama'ah. But there is a gap in front of you or there is a gap, gap to the right hand side of you or the left hand side of you. So what it means somebody has broken their wudu and he has gone to do with the wudu. So he's left a gap in the saf. 
So the person who is directly behind that person should take one step and replace him in the saf. So you take one step and you go into the place of that person. The space to your right or the left should be filled in from the people behind you. So every saf should be complete. There should be no gaps. And how we achieve this, if somebody has left the saf because of its necessity, then we take a step and you go into that saf. Some people think that they have to drag their heels when they're doing so. If they don't do so, their namaz will break. Again, there is no such thing. Take as little movement as possible because I'm sure you will not manage to go into the front saf ahead of you without any part of your body remaining on the ground unless you're going to leap there. Okay? So as long as you take one step and you replace the person in that saf, then your namaz is complete and this is what should be done. Not out of choice. Okay, should I, should I not? Nay, you should do this to complete the saf. Jiba iftikhar, maaf karna. Baat kar bhi pooch sakte, you don't have to stand up. Jee. Bhai is asking the question that somebody has just <coughs> come to the masjid, the imam is in salah, the congregation is in salah, the imam has gone into ruku, now you want to join the salah, so how should you join the salah? First and foremost, the first takbir, which we call takbir tahrima, that is farz, obligation, obligatory, compulsory. So you will say Allahu Akbar. Now the question is, will you tie your hands or will you release your hands or will you go directly in ruku? So the correct answer is, you will say Allahu Akbar takbir tahrima and you will tie your hands. And thereafter you will say a second takbir to go into ruku and you will go into ruku. Why? Because the tying of the hands comes with takbir tahrima. And that is also a sunnat of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ke takbir tahrima ke baad haath ka bandna ye sunnat hai. So once you've said takbir tahrima, Allahu Akbar, tie your hands. You have fulfilled that sunnah. Now you want to join the imam in ruku, say the second takbir, Allahu Akbar, and join the imam in ruku. Whilst you're going down in ruku, imam says, Sami Allahu liman hamida. And you didn't share even one tasbih in ruku, then you've lost that rakat. Some people wait. Let me wait for the Imam to stand up. Oh, the Imam is in sajda and they're standing waiting. What are you waiting for? You can join Salah in every position. Even in Qawma. Imam is in Sami Allahu liman hamida. That's Qawma. You've come. You can say Allahu Akbar. Release your hands. You're in Sami Allahu liman hamida. Rabbana lak alhamd. You can join the Salah there. You can join the Salah in Qaida. Jalsa. Jalsa is in between the two sajdas. Again, people wait. What are you waiting for? Join the salah. You can join the salah in any position. Ji. 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 Brother is asking if somebody has passed away and to benefit them with reward which we call isal e sawab Is it permissible to do an Umrah for them? Yes, it is absolutely permissible for somebody to do an Umrah for a deceased. When you do an Umrah for the deceased, it is just your intention. Oh Allah, I am doing an Umrah. Please reward all the deceased of this Ummah. Hazrat Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all the Sahaba and all the deceased of this Ummah and especially my late grandfather. Allah will give ajr to everyone and yourself. So it is permissible to do an act, an amal in which you make an intention for the reward for your deceased relatives. Ji bhai. Bhai, niche se koi khabar nahi aari, kya ho raha hai? Ji. Talha, no question. Ji bhai, bolo. Sharing 
Brother is asking when you are forwarding messages on WhatsApp. So for example, you've received a message that says that this person is X and X and X. So somebody is slandering another person. They are saying something derogatory about that person. So the question is, if you forward that message, would that be classed as ghibat, backbiting, which is a very severe sin? The answer is yes. If you have received something and you forward it, whether you verify it or not, as long as it is derogatory about a Muslim brother or sister, then you will be sinful. Even if it's the truth, you will be sinful. Any message that you receive regarding any person that this person is this, that, the other, you delete it immediately. And you say, Astaghfirullah al -Azim. You show disgust at this message. So you delete it, you show disgust to it. Bas. Otherwise, if you share it, or if you're even entertained by it, then you will be part of that sin. Allah save us. The Sunnah way of cutting the hair. This is a very important question. And this is something that the madrasa staff in our madrasa and every madrasa in the country, they're all crying about. Because for some reason, I don't understand why the parents find this very, very challenging. When it comes to the hair, listen, the hair should be equal. At least it should seem to be equal. You're not, we don't going to measure the hair with a, with a tape measure or with a ruler. It should look equal. Where does this ruling come from? This ruling comes from the sunnah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The day has a Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala and passed away as a martyr in Muta. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got the news that his cousin, the brother of Ali radiallahu an, has just been martyred in Muta. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, let's go and visit the house of Ja'far radiallahu an, to share our condolences with the family and to congratulate the family because Ja'far is a shaheed. So when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went there, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam found the children of Ja'far radiallahu an, with partial hair on the head and partial head shaved. So in this day and age, we can call it shaved back and side, or we can call it fade, skin fade. So in those days, somebody cut their hair where there was skin fade. Partial head was shaved and there was hair on the other part of the head. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that this is wrong. This needs to be corrected. Either leave all the hair or shave off all the hair. From this, the ulama have deduced that the hair of the head should be equal it cannot be unequal where the sides are extremely short and the hair on top is very long so it comes from this hadith and the instruction of nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam one reason the second reason is nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said man tashabbaha bi qaumin fa huwa minhum that whomsoever you shall emulate you will become from amongst them so this is not the Muslim traditional method of having your hair. This is a fashion that people have taken, adopted, emulated. And unfortunately, these fashions, when they come into our homes, they come through the channels of disbelievers. So you are imitating the kuffar and the disbelievers, which is haram in Islam. So this is another reason for why the hair should not be like this. And our jurists, the fuqaha, they are unanimous on this masla, that the hair should be equal. And this is the reason why so many parents, unfortunately, they do these fade cuts for the children. We give them a letter to remind the parents that they, something needs to be done about the hair. So the child will stay absent for a week, two weeks, and then sent back to madrasa. And they say, the hair has grown back. But we... Listen, if your son has a fade haircut or not, it's no skin of the nose of your son's ustad. But you need to realize the impact on you and on your innocent child. This is one act where the guna, the sin, is 24 hours. 
If you cut your child's hair in this manner, even whilst your child is asleep, you are being sinful. Even when your child is performing his salah and he makes you smile and you should smile, Subhanallah, my child is performing namaz. Unfortunately, even at that time, you are getting guna because of what you have done to his hair. In Urdu, this is called be lazzat guna. Aisa guna jiski koi lazzat hai hi nahi. So please, be mindful. There is a reason for this. These principles of the madrasas and the rules, they've not just been plucked out of thin air. This is our nurturing. This is our deen. So these rulings are important. Okay? Ji. Eyebrows, you should not shape your eyebrows. This is generally the women, they do this. They, 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 they shape their eyebrows. Again, this has become an epidemic, a pandemic. Whereas in hadith, such women are cursed. Those women that do it and those women that have it done. As far as hair in the middle, and if it's such that it makes a person feel un very uncomfortable and it makes a person look like some of our students in Madrasa, they called another student Batman. <laughs> so we asked him, why is he saying Batman? So he said, Mulsab, look at his eyebrows. <laughs> Batman eyebrows. So if you're feeling uncomfortable and you have to remove the hair in between your brows, then that will be permissible. But do not shape like a woman. Tiga bhai. What about the beard? <laughs> the length of the beard. Again, the length of the beard should be one fistful. Again, people ask, where has this come from? Is it in the Quran Sharif? Yes. The beard was recited today in the Quran Sharif. Because Musa alayhi salam, when he came down from the mountain and he saw that his people started to do shirk, he became angry and the first thing he did, he grabbed his brother, Harun alayhi salam. And he grabbed him by his beard and he grabbed him by his hair and he pulled him. And he said, did I not leave you in charge? So he said, لا تأخذ بلحيتي ولا برأسي. Oh my brother, these people, they warned me and threatened me that they will kill me. You don't realize what happened whilst you were away. So the beard has been mentioned in the Quran. If Musa salam was able to grab it, it was a fistful. And remember, Musa's fist wasn't small. Musa salam's fist was big. Hence, one punch killed that uh, person. So it should be a fist. But this is Musa alayhi salam. In Bukhari Sharif, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhumah says that whenever I used to go for Umrah, after Umrah, I would take my beard a fistful and make sure it is a fistful. So it should be a fistful. Any hair which protrudes on the side or which makes the beard look very untidy, you can trim it slightly to keep it tidy. This is a sunnah. So we must wear it with pride and it must be neat. Don't say it's a sunnah and then you look like a broom. <laughs> Nay, it's a sunnah, wear it with pride and look after it. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam would apply oil to his beard. So whatever, add oil, water and look after your beard. But make sure it's a fistful. It should be a fist and this is sunnah. Does that answer your question? There is no such thing as halal mortgage. If I start opening a shop and I say halal pork, you're going to come buy halal pork sausages from me. By putting the word halal does not make something halal. There is no such thing as halal mortgage. I know there are many brothers that are in tight situations and they want me to say that there is halal mortgage. There isn't. Unfortunately, there is no such thing as a halal mortgage. Look at the reason. Interest usually is haram. If you've borrowed a hundred thousand, you should only be giving back a hundred thousand. If you're paying back a hundred thousand pounds and a penny, it will become haram. Why? Because that penny is interest. You're giving interest and they are taking that interest. So unfortunately, there is no such thing as a halal mortgage. Jibai.
Yes, every masjid should have an area where for the musafirin, those that are traveling, for example, sisters, somebody is traveling, a family is traveling, they see the minaret and they come to the masjid and they need to pray. So every masjid should have facilities for where traveling sisters are able to use the bathroom, able to do wudu and able to perform their salah. Just like the men, you walk into the masjid, you go to the bathroom, you've got the wudu khana, you've come into the masjid, you've prayed and you've gone. So similarly, a place must be kept in every masjid so that women can do this. However, this place must be secluded where no men can go in, no men can see in. This is how it should be arranged. As far as women coming to the masjid, it is not permissible for women coming to the masjid. Things in the United Kingdom are evolving and changing, like we said, because scholars are evolving and changing. Because all of these years, ever, from, ever since our childhood, we knew that women is, are not permitted to come to the masjid because it is a means of fitna. And again, people don't have the knowledge. If you look into what Hazrat Aisha radiallahu anha said after the demise of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said about women coming for salah, then you would very easily understand that this is the 21st century. This is a zamana of fitna where every man and woman is forever under test in this day and age, even if it was permissible 20 years ago, even if it was permissible 20 years ago, in this day and age, it wouldn't be permissible. Unfortunately, some masjids did open the doors to women and they faced problems. And when they faced problems, what did they do to the problem? They swept it under the carpet. They hid it from the people so that it doesn't become a problem. There is a very senior scholar, Hazrat Mufti Kifayatullah Sahib, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, who is a contemporary of Hazrat Manana Ashraf Ali Thanvi, Rahmatullahi Alayhi. He's written a book, Kafful Mu'minat and Huduril Jama'at. It's in Arabic, translated into Urdu and in English. And he explains, Kafful Mu'minat, the stopping of believing sisters and Huduril Jama'at in presenting themselves in the Jama'at in the Masjid. Because it is a means of fitna. And this day and age, women, how will they come to the Masjid? Perfume, the best this, the best that. Who's going to keep an eye on them? We're struggling to keep an eye on our children in the masajid. We will have plenty of volunteers to volunteer to look after our sisters. And then you know what's going to happen. En route to the masjid. En route home from the masjid. There are many, many fitnas, brothers. That's why our scholars have prohibited it. Bas. Jazakumullah wa khaira. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.